Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Last Three Miles to Disrupt the Trillion Dollar Utility Industry. We're going to go ahead and get started. And in order to do that, I'd like to introduce New Solar's founder and CEO, Arnold Leitner. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, our first webinar. And my name is Arnold Leitner. I'm the founder and CEO of New Solar. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a, a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we have a Q&A uh, uh, chat. So if you have any questions during this seminar, please um, put your questions there and we'll um, have an opportunity to answer hopefully most of them at the end of this uh, presentation. We also like to point out that we're recording today's webinar. So for those uh, that have uh, not opportunity to listen in, they can uh, refer to it later. I also want to already give you a heads up. We have two pop quiz in the middle of the seminar, which I think you find very interesting. Uh, we're testing your knowledge and uh, we'll raffle some new solar t-shirts uh, uh, next uh, after this webinar for those uh, uh, who answered uh, most of them correctly. So with that, again, thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, the title of our webinar today is The Last Three Miles to Disrupt the Trillion Dollar Utility Industry. I know these are big words. Many of people have tried this before and have spent more than three miles doing so. Uh, but today, I think we want to show you uh, that this disruption has already occurred. And we like to segment it into three miles, which we believe are pretty appropriate uh, in terms of describing what's already on, on its way. So without further ado, uh, let me get started and let's look at the first mile in this journey. So the first mile was rooftop solar. Somewhere in Germany in the mid-90s, um, with a lot of incentives, uh, German homeowners in particular, but not the only ones, this also occurred in other parts of the world, but very strongly, primarily in Europe, in Germany, uh, incentives provided by the government allowed homeowners to put photovoltaic panels on the roof, which at the time, just the panels themselves cost about $8 a watt. It was a very expensive way to produce energy, and it required on sub subsidies which in Germany uh, were handled in a way that the uh, homeowner would sell electricity uh, to uh, the utilities at a certain price at a very high premium and then purchase otherwise its electricity at a regular rate. Uh, other countries, um, primarily the United States, have taken different approaches where basically you just balance uh, the amount of energy you send in against the amount of energy you purchase back from the utility that's referred to as net metering. Uh, but the Germans, importantly, and as we'll see in a moment, uh, important for the next mile, introduced a different concept where you are paid a certain price and you received uh, for sending solar energy and you paid the standard utility rate. Now, around the year 2008, uh, 2009, uh, something very big happened is that uh, the Chinese manufacturers brought very low cost uh, solar panels into the market. They've all uh, based on monocrystalline and polycrystalline silicon. And they really changed the landscape uh, for solar in that prices just started, started to drop. And we arrive now, or have arrived rather, at a point where solar electricity from the roof is produced at a lower cost than virtually any other form of electricity. It is very low cost, it is also right above the head of the consumer. And also, very importantly, for those who have been involved in large-scale solar power plants or watch that market, it doesn't come with any habitat destruction um, or impact in habitat. No matter how carefully you plan and construct a ground-mounted solar array, you will occupy land. And especially as we want to move forward and penetrate the market even deeper, make solar a ubiquitous form of energy or even the largest form of energy, we will need more space than we have out in nature, so rooftops are ideal. So there you are, you're the homeowner, you're proudly producing your own electricity and you kind of think that you already beat the system, that you are independent of utility, but sure enough, you recognize quickly that you're only energy producer and that only about 30 to 40% of the energy that you produce on the roof are coincident uh, with your demand in the house. That's very typical for residential customers. On the weekend, you may consume more, but during the day, you're usually at work and 60 or so percent of the energy go to the utility, to the grid, and come back at later times uh, to you. So you probably felt dissatisfied by that emotionally because you just invested in this green technology on the roof. 
but also you were started to feel it economically. And that's again, something that happened in Germany because of that price differential that exists in that market versus what you sell and what you purchase back, there was an opportunity for an arbitrage. So if I sell as currently roughly my solar electricity of four to five euro cents, and I buy back like my mother in Germany for about 30 to 40 euro cents, uh, there's a gap, there's, a, there's an opportunity to ask yourself, you know, for that 25 or 30 cents per kilowatt hour, am I not able to store that solar electricity uh, right here at my house? And that created a market for um, batteries. And of course, everyone who has been in the solar business knows that batteries have been a big part of off-grid solar. Uh, but until recently, they didn't make sense for the kind of energy arbitrage we're discussing here because um, they were too cost, uh, not cost effective. You, uh, you had primarily, primarily the choice of, of lead acid type batteries and they really are not cost effective, including their reduced lifetime and the oper operation and maintenance headaches that come with it. But here comes lithium ion, coincidentally, fortuitously into the market. And it was possible now to store your energy in batteries and the market for solar batteries as a typically are called uh, begin. And now we covered the second mile, right? We now have storage and we have replicated a lot of the utility industry. We have now an energy source with the solar panels and we have storage that gives us a form in the speak of utilities, dispatchable or firm power. So here we are and uh, this is the step that the industry has taken and uh, they introduced these solar batteries. And here's a little bit of a, a overview of typical specifications of these batteries. And let's uh, not focus here on this amount of stored energy, which is typically somewhere around the 10 uh, kilowatt range, plus or minus a few kilowatt. But let's look at the power ratings of these batteries. So we're seeing numbers here like seven, five, three, seven, six, nine, eight. OK, so we got an idea. These are kind of sub 10 kilowatt systems bigger than five kilowatt. All right, so let's take a look and ask ourselves, um, how much power, however, does my utility provide me? Is this power from this battery sufficient? So the questions that we have here, we're gonna have a little pop quiz for you. Does my utility in the United States typically provide me with eight kilowatt of power? It's commensurate with what, what these solar batteries produce. Is it twice as much? Is it 60 kilowatt or is it 48 kilowatt? So we're gonna have a short pop quiz here. We give you, you know, 10, 20 seconds to get in the answers and it's up now. So please go ahead and, and wager your guesses. Uh, you can only choose one of the answers here. All right. And uh, there are a lot of uh, responses coming in. We'll let it trickle for a little while. Okay. Um, all right, we're slowing down. Okay, more coming in. All right, uh, we got about two thirds of people uh, have voted. So let's just uh, call it at the end of the poll and I'm gonna share the results with you. So uh, most of you thought about 16 kilowatts. So the battery can provide about half of the power to home, but you know, quite a few um, thought it was eight kilowatts and, and, and a smaller portion, about a quarter, yes, 40 kilowatts, which indeed is the correct answer. So um, with this, let's just take a closer look at uh, the utility uh, power supply. Here's your typical home, uh, has a 200 ampere connection in utility speak again at 240 volt in the United States. Uh, levels of power are slightly lower in Europe, but they're commensurate. Otherwise, if you multiply those two numbers, you multiply current by an electric potential, you end up with power and 200 times 240 is 48 kilowatts. So, that's what the utility provides to a typical home. I'll say though that larger homes now have even higher interconnections, but let's stick with this for a moment and take our thought a little further. And so what do we see here? Despite our storage, we're still entirely reliant on the utility for power. Now we're producing our own energy, we're storing our energy, but when that air conditioner turns on or that toaster goes off, I am reliant on utility. And just give you an example, if you, make a toast in the morning, run the coffee maker and go in the bathroom and blow dry your hair. This is for the, more for the ladies in the room. Um, you likely will almost overload half of the solar batteries that you saw here uh, earlier in the specification sheet, unless of course you are tied into the grid 
and be receiving the additional power from the utility. So what this really means that despite your solar battery and your rooftop uh, solar array, you still, you still holds all the power. And I mean it figuratively and literally. So here are the two things. Number one, uh, so apologize. First of all, um, the utility requires permits for um, grid tie. Whether you actually net meter or not, that doesn't matter. If you interconnect a system like your battery with a uh, power supply from utility, you have to get a permit or approval, whatever you want to call it. But then there's also the technically reality that you will be depend will you will be depending on the utility for power, and so really uh, you cover the first mile, the second mile. I'm making my own energy, I'm storing it, but you're really still a utility customer despite of your solar battery. So what will make the difference is the third mile, and the third mile is a high power inverter driven by a high power battery system. And there's actually a little bit of a mile 3A and a mile 3B, which will show uh, the differentiation in a moment. But that is really where everything starts to change. In the background, we show you the user interface um, of the power block where you know, the load is running at 17.4 kilowatt, not the maximum, but kind of indication of, of how high power we are talking. We have to be in the 25 or 30 kilowatts uh, continuous uh, high load to be able to really replicate utility supply. So before we go there, we need to learn a little bit more about uh, peak load and average load to understand how this disruption is coming about. And we don't have to go very far. We can just go to Wikipedia and type in electric power distribution and see what comes up. And just two paragraphs into it, we'll stumble across something pretty interesting that says that the peak load in a power distribution system, number of homes in your street, is about 10 times higher then the average load these homes consume. So all of the energy consumed over the year divided uh, by the hours. All right, so, but that averages a couple of homes, doesn't even take into account instantaneous peak loads. So let's return uh, to our home that we looked at earlier and create a little bit of a sphere here, a circle uh, showing the 48 kilowatt utility supply that the home can receive. When could you hit that number? Well, you'd never want to quite hit it because your home will go dark. So the utility makes sure it is as generous for the typical home. But say you are on vacation, the home was warming up, you come home and you have a central air conditioner, you press the, you push the thermostat to 72 and suddenly all the currents rush into these compressors. Uh, there's a very high current, we call it the inrush current, which results in very high power levels. You can snap up into the 30 or 40 kilowatt rating despite the fact that the appliance itself is only rated continuously at some you know 10 or 15 kilowatt so that is what the utility must cover but really on a sustained peak level the kind of stuff that you can see on the utility bill on a 15 minute or five minute or hourly level you never usually go much beyond 24 kilowatt as you saw earlier that example was a load running at 17 kilowatt uh, but about 24 is about what you should plan for now, that is what the Wikipedia article kind of referred to because it was already averaging various homes. And uh, now we learned from that article that the average power demand for that home is only 2.4 kilowatt. So what does that mean again? That means that's the entire energy consumed by the house divided by the hours in the year or the month. And that is the amount of energy without solar I'd be su su being supplied from the utility. So if I had my own high power inverter at home, then you know I would only need two and a half kilowatt of connection to the utility, and I would drive my own loads with say up to 48 kilowatt, but typically 24. Now let's take a step further because we're in a solar business. We're adding a solar array. We have a solar array, so our battery and inverter system is energized by our solar system. And let's just say that because the size of our battery is some variability and demand, I can cover 90% of my load out of my battery. I send some to the grid and get some back from the grid or lose it and buy some depending on how you hooked up. And that would mean though, that the average power that needs to flow from the utility into my home to still allow me to live a normal lifestyle with a central air conditioning and all the trappings of life has fallen by a factor of 200 down to 240 watts. So let's keep this thought for a moment. 
And notice that what we need is a grid forming inverter, high power, but grid forming. What we mean by that, that's the thing that creates the grid to the house and that we can also break the grid tie. And that's interesting, important for many reasons, including that at that point, as we'll see shortly, we no longer need to talk to utility about what we're doing inside of a home. So here's how this looks like in actuality. This is a simplified line diagram of the power block. And let's take a look. Uh, first of all, you will notice already there's a separation between the grid and the power system created by the power block. And in between is uh, the nano grid represented here in red. And what we have on the right hand side is a, is a big inverter. So we made that red box large and a big load. That's our central air conditioning system turning on after coming home from a vacation on a hot summer day. And what we have is our own independent grid. We no longer have the utility grid on the left touching our system, our home, our breaker panels at all. And because of that, we don't see any of the transients, any of the power outages, or any of the things that happen on the utility grid. We actually end up with perfect power. We are only supplied by our own inverter. Now, most people, are grid connected, live in, the, in, the, in suburban areas, are not off grid. So they'll decide and opt smartly to source some of the energy from the utility to make up for variability, to be able to size batteries and panels economically so that they meet you know, an optimal balance for them, themselves. But they still will likely use some energy from the grid, maybe not all the time, maybe not for weeks, like maybe not for a day, but there's a rectifier that will bring that energy into this nano grid. And let's see what a rectifier is and why it changes everything in the relation, why it turns grid tie that requires utility approval to grid connected. So here's a rectifier. Um, I simplified, and you can think of it as a one way equalizer. On the left side, we got the wiggly lines of the utility power supply, some transient, you know, AC voltage, things going up and down, mostly good. Uh, but then on the right hand side, it goes to the rectifier and all you get is direct current, calm, filtered, entered as energy. You should think of it now into your nano grid. Now, most of you think uh, I've never seen a rectifier. Uh, this is a novel device. Well, you do own a rectifier almost certainly. Uh, here's an example. This would be a, a power supply for a Macintosh computer. And uh, what's interesting about this example is not just that you have one, probably just a few feet away from you but that it actually has 87 watt. All right, so we earlier noted that we only need 240 watt to interconnect with the utility to meet all of our lifestyle, live on and to have all the power, 48, 24 kilowatt that we need to run our modern life. But we only need devices, connectivity, that's commensurate about three of those little Apple chargers. That sounds really a dramatic shift. And that's indeed what's possible. So here we want to just introduce you to the power block and specifically to the type of architecture uh, that we're using. And here's a picture of the current 19 inch rack systems that we're installing and that are already operating with various customers, primarily here in California. And what's unique about the power block is that it's the only system right now in the market that uses a fully parallel direct current architecture that is patented and what do we mean by that? And then we'll see why that's very valuable. So what we mean by that is that every single component of the power block is modular and parallel and doesn't depend on any of the other elements in the system. So every module, every battery module of which you can have multiple and break them down, any module to bring in uh, solar power from the roof, to bring in utility power, to bring in generator power, to bring in wind power, Anything you have is fully parallel. So any of those elements could be anywhere in any of the cabinets and more cabinets, fewer cabinets, taller cabinets. You can stack them in any order. Uh, it doesn't matter. Similarly, similarly, every solar panel is equipped with a microconverter that again turns every individual solar panel into an interactive parallel power uh, module on the system. You might not nod your head and say, oh, I know that. That's a microinverter and face makes those. No, that's not. It is kind of the same way and that you step up the like, potential of the panel, but inverters, microinverters, step it up to alternating current 
while DC DC microinverters step it up to direct currents. And that is again not the same as optimizers such as Solar Edge or others. This is stepping up exactly to the high electric potential, the operating potential of the system about 380 volts and makes every panel entirely independent of each other. So you ask yourself the question, why would I care? Well, the reason this is so valuable is because now you have a scalable system. The same power block technology, the same modules I showed you earlier in a residential system, mid-sized home also are used in a home that's taller, larger. This is not even remotely the biggest power block we can make. We'll show you later much bigger systems, but you can just plug and play. You can have one solar array, two solar arrays, three solar arrays, 99 panels, 93 panels, 15 panels, 25 batteries, 12 batteries. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for controls. It doesn't matter for interconnection. You can just build out of the same blocks, whatever system you want. You can have three phase power coming out of the system, at 208 volt, you can have that what's called a Y, you can have a delta, you can have single phase power coming out of it, you can have all three come out of the power block at the same time. It doesn't matter because everything is in parallel uh, in the system. The other advantage that comes with it, which is implied by what I just said, is the ability of the power block to be multi source. For fun, we throw everything at you here, uh, but we have a customer that does have wind, with small wind turbine, solar a battery a generator and sources energy from the grid. But the nice thing is all of those sources interact on a common point in parallel on the DC grid. They don't need to be switched back and forth. They all actually respond to the needs of the home based on their in, 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 in inherent cost. So what's known utility speak as modular cost, solar, you already built it, you already paid for it, you already finance it. So sun is free, so that would be the first energy source that immediately flows onto the bus. The next one would presumably be the battery and or the utility, depending on what is cheaper, what you want to use, and then you can also stack the other sources in whatever dispatch order, in whatever sequence you like, and all of this is done just by small changes of the electric potential and again settings that are fully dynamic in each of those modules that bring in those various sources of power to deliver whatever power system at whatever order of usage that you like. And you have no limits. You can have three generators. You can have a three-phase generator. You can have four generators. You have two wind turbines. It doesn't matter. It's fully parallel. So as we discussed earlier, we only connecting to the grid to rectifier. Now that rectifier could also connect to a generator. That really doesn't matter. It's just a matter of bringing energy from an alternate current source into the home. That generator could be 120 to 40, that utility grid could be 208 volt, could be European to 30, it doesn't matter. And if that rectifier turns off or doesn't produce any energy, you have your batteries, you have your solar and you are off grid. So grid forming is just a way to say that you are both grid connected and off grid always at the same time. So the homeowner of this uh, beautiful uh, vacation home presumably would not require a different power block than someone uh, living in a city who's supplementing some energy from the grid. Would be the same product, would be absolutely identical. And of course, you probably immediately can see the possibility of grid defection when people realize, well, you know, maybe I can do without the utility at all. Let me just add another battery and I can make those decisions at any time. So that's all good for the homeowner, uh, for reliability and everything. But the question is, this is also good for utilities. And it really depends for utilities, and I'm an ex-utility uh, energy consultant. I spent five years uh, with a consulting firm. Uh, the question for the utilities is really, what's good for me here and on what side of this business do I choose to be in, to be on? And let's go through some of the advantages that we have for the power system as a whole, commonly referred to as the grid, but also distribution systems are included here and power plants. So let's call it all power system. The first one is take a look at uh, this picture, which I think looks awfully familiar for most of you. This is kind of the distribution level system in your street. And here's a line worker working on something, but that's the kind of hardware you need to deliver 48 kilowatts to a home or multiple homes uh, down the street. Now, if one home or more homes move to a, a high power nano grid, well, they only require equipment that pg e could put in its shopping basket and take to the home to install. Okay? Your three Macintosh 
power supplies would certainly fit in this. And that's kind of all that's required. And this is not an overstatement. This is indeed all that is left to have a fully modern home using solar and supplementing some of the utilities. So utilities can take a look like, oh, you know, we don't have to do line upgrades anymore. We can design new subdivisions with much less power infrastructure. So that's an advantage to the utility. Um, the other one we want to think about is we said earlier in this hypothetical example, which is very, very representative, I assure you that, uh, well, we charge a nanogram 24 hours, you know, at 240 watts, because that's kind of, you know, what we're missing, because, you know, the world's not perfect, batteries are not free, I need to choose my battery size. Um, but then, you know, you realize that in the summer months, you might never be connected to utility, it might never turn on, the rectify it never turns on. And then you start saying, well, you know, overall, let's just change my thinking, let me get a one kilowatt uh, rectify, okay, you know, I'm not 200, 200th anymore, I'm 150th of the power needs. And, you know, and now every six hours I uh, charge, apologize, uh, for six hours in the day, I charge for the grid, the rest of the time, I'll turn it off. So what we have here is zero or one kilowatt. And what you end up with is a form of a digital grid where the utility doesn't have to be concerned about keeping the power on at all times or whatever level, most importantly, not at 48 kilowatt to an individual home, but you know, well, they're on in the afternoon for six hours or not at all. So it's a binary kind of decision, which makes a lot of things a lot easier. It allows for a simpler grid operation. And best, when I say grid, I'm very well aware that we talk about distribution level operation, but we'd like to use one term here uh, to make it simpler for communication. Uh, for the homeowner, in turn, having such a large battery, uh, they can also decide to schedule their energy purchases exactly when they want them uh, based on uh, prices on the market. So these advantages operationally for um, utilities and for the homeowner, all of this of course can interact and these systems can talk to utilities or utility pricing. Uh, but there's also an even bigger, apologize, uh, macro, uh, impact. And here we're showing you today's grid, which has large access capacity, PICA plants, large pipes, large distribution power lines for this that, you know, hold very little average demand. But when peak demand hits um, the market on a hot day, uh, everyone is home, then uh, the peaking power plants turn on, they're very expensive, there's infrastructure that's almost overrunning, and you and presumably even up with a brownout unless you wanna invest a lot into oversized infrastructure. As you allow consumers to have more high power solar battery systems in their home, these nanogrids, first of all, uh, you can get rid of, of peak of capacity indicated here by an extra chimney missing because the power, the really the thing that's so expensive is actually done at the location of the home. Uh, your average demand will go up because you can make the pipes uh, lower because the average, you know, this difference between maximum load and an average load has been reduced. And you end up with a grid doing peak demand where, you know, you fewer peak of plants. And hopefully if you have a well-designed system, you also no longer have brownouts. That even includes the ability, of course, to drop some of these customers off supply entirely if they don't choose to do so, because you want to inconvenience them that much because they live happily on the power block battery, certainly for more uh, than an hour of typically maybe 24 hours or longer. Uh, then there's also, of course, the issue of that customer that every utility has and more than that, uh, that lives at the end of a power line, one or two more houses. And, you know, there's an outage of tree falls and you have to send an entire crew out there to bring them back online. They'll be unhappy. Maybe they work remotely. Uh, they have to pack up and drive to the town, work at the coffee shop. They're not happy with you at all. But if you as a utility or the homeowner on its own initiative had a high power nanogrid, there's no power in the house from the utility to the house, I should say, there's no rush. You can take care of that uh, problem on your clock and that reduces a lot of costs. You don't have to have that many maintenance fleet people available. You don't have to dispatch them in the middle of the night. Uh, you can, those customers can comfortably wait. So, um, the question now that you probably have for me is, that sounds great, Arnold, uh, but where are the customers, right? Does anyone actually do this already? And uh, these customers are at our doorstep. On uh, a few days ago, the New York Times, I think it was Monday 13th, published an article that frustrated with utilities 
some Californians are leaving the grid entirely or partially, and as, as we know, and uh, they're citing blackouts, uh, wildfires. People are live on wells. This home, you presumably, has its own well. And if there's an amber flying on your property, you want to put it out. But if you have no power from utility, you have no water. And your typical solar battery that I showed you earlier certainly doesn't have enough power to pump water from a 100 or 200 foot well. So you will need something more powerful than that, more reliable than that. And that's where nano grids come in. There's also even an, a, a tipping point of price arbitrage. It certainly has long been passed on the generator side, which of course is the reason why generator companies have gone into the purchase of solar battery technology companies. We are a factor of four beyond uh, that already in cost effectiveness, uh, but even on the utility pricing side, you're starting to see some arbitrage opportunities in certain markets and certainly for certain time of use pricing. The New York Times uh, quotes experts, and we only agree with them, and we have been predicting this since the start of the company doing some forward analysis that millions of people could eventually go off the grid as costs drops, costs drop, and we agree. That's is what we are seeing. And just to give you an idea, uh, we are a small company. We have limited ability to serve all customers, but this is our California uh, pipeline and systems that are operational. Three of them, uh, five of them are currently under construction. Most of them are fully installed, just require, most of them are fully installed, require just commissioning. And then we have on a contract and a number of opportunities. Uh, that's right here at home. But even um, outside California, we have uh, two, up, two systems that are under construction and a number of opportunities. And only now are we really going to a, a sales modus uh, as a small company. We're going to target the entire market. And we also, in fact, have an international project um, as a matter of two uh, in our pipeline. So um, this is what we see uh, for, us, for us as a small company, uh, but there's more opportunities here, uh, including one that you saw earlier on the slide, if you paid attention. Uh, at the end of the road, uh, we have a project in the Navajo Nation. Uh, this family doesn't have any power at all, uh, but after uh, speaking with us and speaking with the sponsor, they not only wanted to have power and light, now they wanted to have a dryer. So they went from uh, no power to having electric dryer and we weren't USOLA, we weren't the power block if this was no problem for us at all. Um, there are, of course, places all over the world uh, that are at the end of, the, of our long power lines. Uh, you know, you call them destinations, dream locations, such as maybe this, this restaurant at the lake somewhere down under. Um, those are customers right away. Uh, they need reliability. They often pay high rates or they run on generators um, because recall that not all places in the world have the rates that we enjoy here in the United States. Uh, or Europe. Um, then, of course, there are places, uh, as I call places of hope, refugee camps, relief camps, where power infrastructure needs to be built quickly. And, and typically, the fallback is a generator, because if you look carefully between the two nurses, you see a, a, a air conditioning system in the back. You will not run that air conditioning system with any of the solar batteries that you saw earlier, and or they're not even able in the first place to run entirely off-grid. It is not that trivial to build a system that can deliver high power. I want to say that USOLA has designed a system that's going to clinic in Florida that delivers 90 kilowatts of three phase power. We have put out a proposal with a project in, in California that will put out 150 kilowatts of three phase power. Remember, the batteries you looked at earlier have five or 100 or 10 kilowatt. So this is where we see a market very, very strongly. And on the right hand side, you already see a glimpse of the product enclosure we use we intend to use for this market. But the picture is much, much bigger. And the market is actually where the action is. And there's gonna be a pop quiz coming on in a moment where I think we're gonna show you something that you haven't thought about. But the reality is that most people live within 30 degrees of Northern and Southern latitude. And if that's not most of the people, that's where all future demand growth is gonna come from. Old Europe, old America, Old Russia, all these parts do not matter anymore in terms of growth in electricity demand. It's all coming from this band. And as I indicated below there with the global horizontal irradiance, that's the strength of the sunshine. You can see that anything over 1500 is, is, is wonderful. Everything in this band is yellow. Well, that's the point I want to make. So they have great strong solar. But the next point is actually even more important. And that is the question. How will these customers, which are really the ones that are growing, the really the ones that benefit from solar, how are we going to deal with seasonality? 
And we have a multiple question pop quiz here, multiple answer pop quiz here. You can choose more than one. So how could we solve that problem? Is that, you know, well, they just need 40% more solar panels than they thought they needed. And recall that solar panels are increasingly affordable, almost not anymore the driving cost of a solar installation, definitely not of a nanogrid. Uh, yeah, they just have to have 24 hour of energy storage to kind of even out, you know, intraday variability. And, uh, or is it the last one? Well, sorry, Arnold, that's where the entire story of your solar goes bust. So uh, you get a chance here to uh, vote. Uh, we're gonna pop up a quiz here and ask you for your thoughts. How can we handle this? All right. Um, the answers are coming in, all right. Uh, so half the people have uh, voted. Okay, well, let's slow it down. Maybe three quarters of respondents that that's what we got last time. Okay, things are getting um, towards the end. All right, so let's take a look and uh, let's share the result with you. And the answer is that um, only about 40% of solar panels extra takes care of all the energy mismatch. And uh, yes, a little larger battery of 24 hours is all you need to kind of even out from day to day. And for those people that uh, said that the story goes fast, we'll talk to you offline. Uh, that is not true. So um, here's what we know, and we've been doing this for a long time. And uh, we also own and run a satellite-based solar production forecast service that every one of our power block benefits from in real time. So they know exactly how much energy they're getting. And uh, here's the answer. For those at the outer band, so the, I just reverse colors here, that at 30 or 30 degree latitude, north or south, they don't see a difference in the winter and summer production of more than 30%. It's actually less than that. And as close as they get closer to the equator, it becomes less and less important. So that means 40% more solar panels will make the solar production in the winter the same as in the summer. With that, um, we know that seasonality is not a problem. We know the power block, uh, apologize, I still have struggles sometimes here with the forward of the slide. So um, the solar nanogrid works anywhere. We just found it out from this map. Not only do we have customers everywhere, but seasonality is not a problem. There's large enough solar array and um, a large enough battery can take care of all these seasonality issues. So the question is, of course, how do we take it everywhere? Because it's kind of hard to schlep a you know a couple hundred pounds of battery around and have electricians everywhere that can uh, um, build the system. So our answer is the stackable power block. Here's an example of various sizes. And what I wanna point out is that the electronics we have developed, the parallel architecture already is fully designed, fully ready to move into this form factor. This is no longer a computer graphic. We have actually uh, built this system. This is a patent design. There are a number of US patents that have been issued as well as others that are pending. And uh, this power block design allows us to reduce modular weight uh, to you know, about 125 or below for the battery and everything else being lighter than that. It comes apart, it stacks together, fully uh, plug and play. And uh, what's also important here is that it ships easily, right? It can be shipped to any market. It can be quickly assembled there and it requires no training whatsoever for the part of the solar array interconnection, the power block installation to uh, build the system where an electrician comes in is to connect the output of the inverter to the home. There are three or four different connections to, uh, poles here to connect. If you don't know how to do this, you are not an electrician. Uh, and uh, so it's really down to the basic knowledge and that we believe is gonna be very important and a game changer for this entire industry. So in the end, um, we have uh, one power block to build them all. And what I show here is not eight power blocks of the same stack of design. No, that is one power block. You can scale it up to build this kind of a system here. And that is not even the largest one you can build with this, uh, with this uh, block, uh, with these modules, with these blocks, you can add enough, another 50% to this. And then you would start to slowly approach the maximum size of the power block, both in the rack mounted uh, system I showed you earlier or here in the, uh, in the stackable version, which electrically speaking are identical. 
And so you can see that the power block is ready and can be used in a home in California or be delivered to a clinic in Indonesia. It works everywhere. It works the same everywhere. It doesn't need to rely on utility interconnection. It doesn't even care about the frequency or electric potential for the line voltage coming in. Uh, these are similar and can be taken up by the rectifier all over the world. And with a simple setting on the inverter, you deliver whatever power and electric potential or frequency you need in location. No utilities to talk to, no interconnection agreements to get. Yes, of course, you need a building permit like with everything but that is the same as if you were installing an air conditioning system in the home. So we believe solar nanogrids are going to disrupt the trillion dollar industry, utility industry, and we also believe that this is already occurring, it's already happening. And uh, I want to introduce you briefly to the leadership team here. I'm Arnold Leitner, I'm on the left, um, I'm the CEO and founder. Mike Allman is a director and investor in the company. He was formerly the CEO of Sempra Generation, and built the first, first utility owned solar power plant in the desert southwest near Boulder um, City, Nevada. Later, he built hundreds of megawatts of solar in the desert. Rick Hoskins is a former uh, a private equity fund manager and a director of the company. And Galen Tornaby is our chief operating officer. He's extensive experience in the utility in, in construction industry, including building a large solar thermal power plant in the Middle East. Uh, I would be amiss uh, not to point out that we are on Start Engine. Uh, we're running a, a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, you're welcome to invest. All the information, terms, and how to invest is on Start Engine, and I need to refer you uh, to that site. You can find it by going to startengine.com forward slash usolar, or you can simply Google Start Engine usolar and get to our campaign page where you'll find more information in addition to what I showed you here. You see also more photos of our hardware which will look exactly what I showed you here in the slides and other details. So with this, uh, we'd like to open it up to your questions. Again, um, we have a Q&A tab. We ask you to put in questions. Uh, our, our host, uh, our moderator, Baxter, will uh, sort through them. And I believe he's going to bring them up on the screen or share them to me in the chat box. Yeah, that's right. That's how I find out what the questions are. And so um, let's give it a moment here, and then I will answer the first question. Thank you so much for being on the seminar so far, and I look forward to, uh, to answering your questions. I'm going to take a sip of water, and then we we'll go to the first question. All right. Um, the, the first question we have here, which is uh, one that is uh, technically, I'll try to uh, be as, as cogent as I can be. So, the question is, can the power block be uh, deployed with existing solar? That is a pretty easy question if we're referring to a legacy system, systems that are built with uh, grid tight inverters using strings. And the answer is that in that case, absolutely yes. Uh, we would not use the inverter anymore uh, for powering the home. It is not high power enough, uh, but it could be used with a, we use a relay for that, for allowing it to sink excess energy to the grid. Most customers choose not to do this. Uh, but the solar array, the, the racking in the roof, everything you've already invested, the conduits, all of that can be easily retrofitted by the installation of the uh, step microconverters, as we call it, those DC-DC microconverters on the roof. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, is there a problem interfacing liquid, uh, uh, lithium-ion phosphate batteries with, I presume it was referring to spend our circuit breakers, those are controlled circuit breakers, the answer, those are not questions that are related, and we'll be happy to answer that and, uh, and follow up. Please get in touch with us. Uh, but the answer is uh, yes, uh, these controlled panels can be used in single phase power supply, which most residential homes have with the power block. Although the question arises, other than shedding some energy, uh, if they're actually still needed with the high storage, high power power block. All right, um, let's see if there's another question coming in here. Um, all right, here's a question um, from Andrew. Apologies, the earlier question was from Craig. Thank you, Craig. Um, question from Andrew, in commercial settings, could the system be used for backup of a power sub panel? And the answer is yes, uh, but I'll make a very important point. Um, once you have a battery, you wanna use it. You don't wanna let the battery sit there, you wanna use it. Otherwise, you, know, you have all this wonderful equipment and it uh, doesn't do anything for you. So yes, you can back up large panels, we, you know, we can do uh, three-phase power, we're doing a three-phase uh, 
uh, uh, power in a clip in Florida at 90 kilowatt. And you can decide, of course, which panels you want to back up. But point is, once you have a back battery, you want to add solar to the roof. So you start using the battery. OK, uh, thank you for that question, Andrew. Let's see if there's another question coming in. All right, from Thomas. Um, all right, very good question. One that I have to defer to my uh, uh, engineers for more detailed answers, but it's a good one. Uh, Thomas is asking, is there a role for supercapacitors to bridge the power and energy requirements for residential homes? And uh, the answer is intuitive, but I think I'm right here. Whether you have a regular capacitor or a supercapacitor, the amount of power is very significant, uh, but the amount of energy is very, very limited. So your choice is always between power and energy. And uh, for home, if you talk about short transients, moments of outages, glitches, yes, the supercapacitor can carry you through, but that would be a very short time period. Once you're talking about more than a second, uh, I think you're back, you must be back to a battery. And I'll point out that we use not specifically supercapacitors, but large capacitors also in the power block that has to do with its very unique power architecture, which we cannot cover here, which allows a lot of the parallel, parallel architecture that we have possible. So we have capacitors, we know them very well. Uh, but the answer I think is, is, uh, is, is probably a, a, a no, um, you need to have a battery. So the question is coming in from Chris here, uh, who joined us a little bit after I got started. Is the system grid tight or not? So let's make the differentiation clear here. Uh, there's a difference between uh, grid tie and grid connected. So the system is not grid tied in the way we design a power block. Um, in principle, you could have high power systems that are grid tied, but I don't see the point of doing that because once you deliver all the power to the home, why do you need power from the utility? You can simply use the utility as an energy source and bring it in through a rectifier at that point because um, you don't need utility for power anymore. You can also change the relationship with the utility and not need the approval. But can you be grid connected or off grid? The answer is both. Both are yes, and uh, so most of our homes uh, we have, except for two of them, I'm thinking right now, uh, continue to be uh, grid connected. Okay, let's see if there's uh, more questions in. Um, here's uh, for Mark a question. Um, thank you uh, for your nice words uh, about the presentation. Um, the question is, uh, are we still seeking funding? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, and I had a slide on that. We are on Start Engine. I want to remind those who missed that. We're doing a crowdfunding campaign. You can find us, Start Engine, like in Get Started with the Motor, Start Engine, and you look for your solar, or just type Start Engine forward slash usolar.com. I apologize, startengine.com forward slash usolar, and you can find us. And uh, we are interested also, as a question for Mark, he is in Mexico. Um, it's a great, a great solar resource, and it's the right in that band that we showed earlier. And uh, yes, uh, we also have had some interest, and we have some interest out of Mexico. Okay, let's see if there's another question coming in. Okay, very, very nice. Um, question is from Michael. Does the system uh, monitor energy consumption within an grid by certain appliances, appliance, etc.? So the answer is uh, absolutely. We monitor everything. We also can monitor this remotely for us. The user interface uh, uh, can show you what you're consuming in a very nice and instructive way. It shows you state of charge of battery, uh, how much power is flowing back and forth. Uh, but currently, uh, we are not offering, uh, except for third parties like SpanIO or for three-phase power, we have another vendor, uh, panel level control or monitoring. And some of the reasons, Michael, is uh, to answer this question, it's quite not necessary anymore. Uh, when you have uh, basically a utility substitute a uh, few of us would care uh, where the power is going unless you're really interested in that and you're trying to cut back on energy consumption. But then, you know, you can get these point of use devices to check on various appliances. But because of the large storage that we offer for our customers that we can do very cost effectively and high power on inverter, we basically look like utility. And I think most utility customers uh, do not care or do not look into those questions. But the answer is on a power level, whole home, yes, absolutely. For the various sources, yes, absolutely, but not breaker by breaker in our own product. All right, um, question from Richard. In, I understand the virtual grid peak applied argument in favor of these systems, but isn't there a phasing problem? Um, this goes back uh, to the question that plagues every industry, the uh, you know constructive deconstruction. Um, 
Will there be stranded assets if utilities don't get on, on, this, uh, uh, on this model? Yes, right? Uh, and definitely on the distribution level side and potentially when that's more and more of these homes on the peak and power side. And in markets are good quickly that are growing. This is not an issue. As a matter of fact, you might be helping the system overall because they cannot be power supply in the first place, take countries like India. Uh, but for the utility, of course, there's a question of which side are you going to be on, right? Because think about it, uh, uh, Richard, if we have one home and we install, say, a $50,000 solar nanogrid with everything, installation costs, solar panels, battery, not a kind of a typical number, that's the amount of capital and that is self-sufficient to 90% and all of the power. That's the amount of capital assets that are moving from the utility side over to the homeowner side. So it's not just energy sales, there's also no power sales or power service anymore. So this is a big transition. This is, of course, the fight utilities are putting up with net metering to not lose that capital base because that's how they make money. But as we try to make clear here, you can't stop us because we are no longer grid tied. We're not longer subject to all of those utility approvals. So yes, um, over time, if utilities don't pay attention, they can suffer in this model. All right, uh, here's a question that came from Tom. Um, all right, so uh, can, can you avoid uh, upgrading a panel if you wanna move uh, from 100 amp panel say to a 600 amp panel because you just bought three Tesla cars at the same time? So the answer is um, that is probably not the most cost effective way. You have a bigger problem with utility for, to start with because uh, you will have to upgrade uh, the main breaker connection, everything coming to the house. Adding a panel is, is not the biggest of the expenses. But I want to point out that um, these uh, loads that come from uh, electric vehicles, superchargers or regular charges, even inside of a home, uh, hit your system with about eight kilowatt. Uh, that's not a ton in terms of power, but significant, especially because it runs for a couple of hours. So uh, can you size a power block to run an electric car charger and car charge a car at night? Absolutely. Have we done it? Yes, we have done it. Um, but uh, it doesn't really avoid your problem of creating sub panels because you have to do it in the house, but it may avoid you need to go to utility and get a larger line and larger main breaker to your home. Hopefully that was a good answer. Tom, uh, Diego is asking, um, all right, uh, does the uh, um, system that is installed outside, you know, does it require um, a certified specialist to maintain and check up on the system? The entire point about the plow block is to remove the need of a specially installer. And when you have a stack of unit, and that's why we like it, that's why we're focusing on it. There's a video on our campaign page and on our YouTube channel where you see me put together the prototype enclosure of the stackable unit. In less than, I think, two minutes, I've stacked up what would be or is a working prototype. So for a system to fail, any panel to fail, that would be the individual panel. We, you know, you could identify that panel, remove it. Uh, the system is designed to be eased so that you can shut the solar array down while running the house with a no chance of anyone electrocuting themselves. You can then also shut down the power block. You cannot disassemble the power block, the stackable one, unless it's shut down. You cannot fry yourself. You can un unstack the modules. You would know what modules affect. If you take it out, you stack the rest back up, you turn it back on as a lay person, and you'll be back in business and you can have your solar pick up uh, you know, that module with a return authorization. So that's how we want to take care of it. That's the whole rational reason behind the stackable and the side of quick installation is making it easy to maintain it. Uh, the question also comes from Diego, what's the lifespan of the batteries? Um, lithium-ion phosphate is now the go-to battery for residential because it's ultimate safety. Uh, but, you know, the amount of cycles you're being, being guaranteed vary back and forth. But, you know, depending on the operation, you're looking at generously 10 to 15 years uh, of, of use of, of, of those batteries and more uh, beyond that. All right. Um, we just have five more minutes left. Let's see if there's uh, another question come in. All right, um, two more questions coming in. Uh, Thomas, uh, how important is the lithium is the battery chemistry versus uh, zinc or other or titanium lithium ion? Um, how is mixing matching of the batteries gonna work? This is uh, about, this is a softball. I hope this wasn't my team, but we don't have anyone who's t uh, Tom on the, on, the, on, the, on the team. So uh, battery chemistry does not matter in terms of overall system design. This is gonna be subject our next webinar 
we explain how we actually do this magic that you have a fully parallel system. Uh, we use a converter uh, that actually connects the battery to uh, the bus and it allows you to put any battery principally in there. And so the battery chemistry doesn't matter, but there's a second part to your question, uh, could it be of interest? Uh, and the question relates to the idea of power batteries versus energy batteries. And uh, so, you know, you can have certain type of batteries that are primarily for energy, you know, that is dis discharged slowly and other batteries that are there for high power. Um, the answer is, Tom, it actually doesn't really matter. Uh, typical residential systems, the amount of storage you need versus the amount of power they require is commensurate. So you often don't end up in a situation where you're looking for a designed power battery. We have other approaches to uh, hit high power uh, surges through uh, capacitors or through other specific batteries that are there not to discharge much energy, but high power. But this is an excellent question, but the point what we want to make is that we are agnostic in principle to battery technology and you can mix and match different technologies in the same power block without any problems. All right, maybe time for one more question. Okay, from Chris, um, what's the maximum voltage input for your micro inverters? Uh, again, I want to specify uh, these are micro uh, uh, converters so they don't put out AC as the word inverter suggests. Uh, the input uh, low voltage, I think we are at 26 volt. Uh, these will be really old legacy panels uh, in the 100, 125, 125 watt range. And we currently go up all the way to 90. Uh, so even the split cell panels, the larger 400 watt panels, I believe have worked just fine. Um, there's no reason for us not to change those input specs, but yeah, very good technical question. We're between 26 right now and 90. Uh, uh, we have a um, specification sheet, all of that on our website. And then input current um, got, uh, I know, uh, I think it's, uh, 10 amps, I believe that's correct, uh, Chris, and output. Um, please follow up on me. I, I'm falling short, I have to do some math in my head right now to get the number right. But uh, basically the answer is you can put 30 of those uh, together in series and use a, a wire gauge 10 cable, which I, equivalent, uh, is equivalent to 30 amps. So I just gave myself the, the answer again. Yes, input 10 amps, output roughly one amp with about a 10X step up. All right, um, we've come almost to the end of our seminar. Let's just give it a moment if there's another question coming in. If not, um, okay, I think we're at the end of our questions. I want to thank everyone uh, for being on this, seminar, on this webinar. Um, I want to uh, remind you um, that uh, we are on Start Engine and uh, we encourage you to invest in our company. We are building systems. We are not in a conceptual stage. Uh, we have hardware. We have enormous amount of software, both from our own satellite-based solar production forecast. We have a very unique differentiated power architecture that allows us to do almost anything uh, you want. We have a patented design for the stackable unit, which we can take everywhere. Uh, and we have a market that's just uh, ringing our phone off the hook. And uh, we're very excited what we can do for the environment and uh, for uh, our customers. So please join us on Start Engine uh, for our campaign. Again, uh, my name is Arnold Leitner. I'm the founder and CEO of USolar. If you want to contact us, please go to our website. Uh, there's a segment in the About section. Get in touch and send us an email or just send it to arnold.leitner at usolar.com. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the end of our webinar. I wish you a, a good and peaceful week. Uh, thanks to everyone, for, to everyone from USolar, and we hope to see you again on another webinar. Bye-bye.